Atronarchs have no binding kinship or alignment with the Daedra Lords, serving one realm or another at whim, shifting sides according to seduction, compulsion or opportunity. Highly intelligent in some cases, while merely destructive forces in others, the elemental Daedra seldom seek the favour of the Daedric Princes. Instead, they carve out their own pockets of oblivion, forged from the collective desires of the race. The home of the Flame Atronarchs, for instance, is one formed entirely from magma, fumaroles and more magma, while the Cold Flame Atronarchs, their realm is equally mundane, only created from the inverse specifications. Here, instead of molten rock flowing like water, the bedrock is subjected to a cosmic degree of cold, causing its material bonds to slide apart and the stone to undulate like gelid lava. According to one Demi-Prince of Boethia, even the Deadlands has more variety than the glut of elemental realms. The simplicity of the elemental Daedra makes them the ideal target for conjurers, as for the most part, they are too predictable for the trickery one would expect from a Dramora. It may come as a surprise then, when I tell you that our records of the elemental Daedra are rife with misconceptions and contradictions. It's as if the other Daedrologists and Law Masters of Tamriel couldn't spare a thought for internal consistency, but I shan't be pointing any fingers. The greatest source of confusion in regards to these creatures comes when we ask the question, what is the difference between an Atronarch and a Golem? Hey guys, it's Drew the Daedrologist here, and welcome back to Fudge Muppet. In this video, we're going to explore the lore of the many types of elemental Daedra, also called Atronarchs, while comparing them to the other kind of Atronarchs, also called Golems. For years, these Daedric beings have been a blind spot in our understanding of Oblivion, but in recent years, more information has come to light, especially since a spotlight has been shone on the interregnum period between the Second and Third Eras. But there are many variants of Atronarch to touch on, so let's get right into it. Elemental Atronarchs are highly intelligent Daedra, with no known affiliation to the Daedric Princes and their realms of oblivion. Due to the nature of their elements, these Atronarchs tend to be at odds with one another. Sometimes this manifests as a burning or freezing hatred, as it does for the Frost and the Fire Daedra. More often than not, the reason for such strong boundaries between the variants of Atronarch can be chalked up to the fact that they cannot practically coexist. Atronarchs, through communal exertion, were able to create their own pocket realms of oblivion perfectly suited to their physiology. Therefore, you can see why a Frost Daedra, who is at home around glaciers and icy tundras, couldn't possibly share a realm with a Fire Daedra, who prefers to nestle inside a volcanic fissure, relishing in the heat emitted by scalding geysers and streams of molten lava. But even when there is animosity between the Atronarchs, we see through the invasion of the Battle Spire that these differences can be set aside. When Mayrunes Dagon recruited legions of Daedra to attack the magical institution, the Frost and the Fire Daedra worked side by side. For the most part, as I said earlier, Atronarchs are free from ulterior motives, and this makes them great for summoning. You can employ an Atronarch for protection, for labour, or even for easy access to their individual elements. For example, you can conjure a Flame Atronarch to act as a personal furnace should you find yourself stranded in the tundras of Skyrim. The mainstream spell used to summon an Atronarch is called Coran's Peremptory Summons, a spell which usually summons Atronarchs in their conventional forms, but which can be altered by conjurers to change the minutiae of the summons. Their summoning was first perfected by the Dureni, especially Corvus Dureni and Peregrine Dureni, who discovered that they could be bound into different forms by their conjurers. These lovely snippets of lore come from the ESO Crown Store and the Crown Crate Showcases, and thanks to this newly accepted canon, we see that Atronarchs can come in a variety of shapes and sizes, and will also serve as mounts and pets. You'd have to have balls of steel to want to ride a flame Atronarch horse, and even if the population of the Second Era did have balls of steel, they'd melt within moments of mounting the creature. 
but hey, I'm but a humble scholar and won't question the infallible histories presented to me. As a result, aside from their conventional forms, you can find Atronarchs resembling horses, sench cats, guars, bears, camels, and wolves. But with newly unearthed sources regarding the province of elsewhere about to be released, this lore is probably subject to revision as new means of monetization are discovered. The term Elemental Daedra fits these creatures nicely, as for the most part, they are humanoid entities built entirely from a single pure substance, be it ice, fire, air, stone, etc. As for the term Atronarch, it's quite difficult to decipher the exact etymology of the word, but we see from multiple sources in Tamrielic history that things with names ending in Nark are used to describe other creatures. In the Song of Pelennor, the Aelid King Umaril the Unfeathered sends a horde of Thunder Narks to fight Pelennor Whitestrake. The text reads, His mace crushed the Thunder Narks that Umaril sent as harriers on the rebellion's long march back south and east. Could this be just another name for Storm Atronarch, or is it something else entirely? Also, the term Atronarch is used for any animated being created from a previously inanimate material. But with all of this in mind, we can hone in on each type of Atronarch specifically, and see which can be classed as elemental Atronarchs and which can be classed as Atronarch Golems. The first and most well understood of the Atronarchs is the Flame Atronarch. They have also been referred to as Fire Daedra, however there is no evidence that they are a different breed of Daedra to the Flame Atronarchs. These beings are fire made flesh. Imperial sketches show that they do actually vary slightly in appearance. Records from Third Era High Rock, Morrowind, and during the invasion of the Battle Spire all show the Flame Atronarchs appearing quite like men or elves, only shrouded in fire, ravenous despite an apparent lack of combustible fuel. More recent records at the end of the Third Era, the third century of the Fourth Era, and even late in the Second Era, show the Flame Atronarch appearing considerably less human. These incarnations are fire and brimstone, lacking any sign of flesh. The flames flow freely from their unconfined forms, licking the air around them without losing shape, like a contained inferno. Whenever I can slip away from the College of Winterhold long enough to summon one, I'm in awe of their elegance. So much destructive power exuding from such a beautiful Daedra as it levitates just above the melting snow, performing pirouettes and graceful flips, leaving in its wake a slender wisp of fire. Unlike the Dramora and most of the lesser Daedra, you won't be summoning a flame Atronarch from the realm of a Daedric Prince. These elemental entities reside in a pocket of oblivion called Infernus. This place is like the bowels of a volcano. It is extreme heat and molten rock as far as the eye can see. As described by the Demi-Prince of Boethia, named Lor Fan Wei Hen, Infernus is a dull place, and he attributes this to the fact that there are physical realms that exist as collective extensions of their numerous, less powerful inhabitants. In his experience, such collective realms tend to be rather mundane and uninteresting, lacking the distinctive qualities of the more personal Oblivion Plains. With Daedric Princes and more powerful Lesser Daedra, realms are projections of the Creator's mind. This is what makes them so unique and interesting to those not privy to the inner machinations of the Architect's psyche. Therefore, it's not that the Elemental Daedra are inherently tedious creatures, it's rather the case that collective realms by design must appeal to every inhabitant. And what do all Flame Atronarchs have in common? A desire to exist in a world with a climate that would sear the skin from the bones of anything that isn't a fire elemental. Before we talk about Frost Atronarchs, the elementals you'd typically assume to be the opposites of the Flame Atronarchs. It's important to note that there exists an inversion of the Flame Atronarch, called the Cold Flame Atronarch. In his dossier on the Elementals, the Dread Archivist of Cold Harbor, a Daedra named Denagoroth, documented his attempts to find new servants for Molag Bal. The Flame Atronarchs had been exemplary workers, and their lysome forms combined with the avid hunger of the arsonist had been incredibly endearing to the slavers of Baal's realm. The problem was that their natural element had been a poor fit for the icy expanses of Baal's domain. So Denagoroth sought a replacement, one with the same grace, and that immediately took the cumbersome Frost Atronarchs out of the picture. Denagoroth scanned over 37,000 different planes, chaos realms, and pocket realities before he found what he was looking for. This place was an inversion of Infernus, called the Fourth Sinus of Takubar. Rather than giving off unpleasant waves of heat, this was an elemental of cold fire. 
and there was a steep drop in ambient temperature in its presence. In behaviour, the cold flame atronarch behaved in all ways like an ordinary flame atronarch. It was just as irritable, casting blue fireballs at any who threatened it, and conjuring pillars of cold flame at need. If we gloss over the unsettling sadism motivating the Dread Archivist's search, it's fascinating to read his process. 37,000 planes scanned, scholars can count on two hands how many Atronarchs we know of, but there are likely countless more out there. Daedrologists have barely scratched the surface of what lies out there in the endless chaos of oblivion. Unfortunately, the ample information we have on flame atronarchs and cold flame atronarchs does not apply to the other elements. Frost atronarchs, like flame atronarchs, vary in likeness across imperial sketches. While they always have a humanoid shape, frost atronarchs summoned to Skyrim tend to appear as though they are completely made from ice. Unlike the flame and cold flame atronarchs, the collective realm of the frost elementals has yet to be discovered. The other known elemental atronarchs include shadow atronarchs, stone atronarchs, air atronarchs, and storm atronarchs. Scarce little is known about shadow and stone. Air atronarchs supposedly came into existence differently to the other elementals, which creates complications when deciding whether or not to class them as atronarchs at all. But we'll hit on that very soon. They possess the power of fire, frost, and shock. Storm atronarchs also take on a vaguely humanoid shape sometimes appearing as solid stone, imbued with a charged blue light, while in other cases, they hover in the air and look like small storms, with rock, lightning and dark clouds swirling in a contained tempest. Storm Atronarchs hail from the pocket realm named Levinus. There is no information on the plane beyond its name, but it would be reasonable to assume that Levinus is the storm equivalent to Infernus or Takubar. There are a few kinds of Atronarch I neglected to list above, some of which even being associated with the elements. But these Atronarchs do not come from the same origins, thus making them a completely different kind of creature. Atronarchs are Daedric beings, whereas Golems are not, even if they are often miscategorized among the Atronarchs. Known types of Golem include air, ash, earth, fire, flesh, ice, iron, stone, and water. This is where things get a little confusing. Didn't we just say that fire, ice, and stone Atronarchs are elementals? Well, they are, but there are also fire, ice, and stone golems, which are created by mages on Mundus, and are not their own race. That is where the distinction lies. Golems are created by mortals, whereas Atronarchs are summoned by mortals from oblivion. In most cases, there's not a great deal to say about golems. They're created to serve as destructive forces by mages. They're only really unique depending on the materials used by the mage. There are two types we actually have solid understanding of, so let's focus on those. First, there's the Ash Guardians. While Ash could very well be considered an element like stone or earth, we can confirm that they are not Atronarchs based on their origins. The Ash Guardians were created by the Telvanni using the Heartstones. Neloth claims that the Heartstones were flung from Red Mountain when it erupted, and they still smolder with the heat of the volcano to this day. It's speculated that their innate magical properties stem from their close proximity to the heart of Lorcan for millennia, and the dead god's power seeped into the stones. This is why the Heartstones could create life from the ash in the form of the Ash Spawn. So when the last Dragonborn learns to conjure an Ash Guardian, it is not the same as conjuring an elemental Atronarch. The Heartstones enable Ash Guardians to exist, and they do not operate individually in their own collective realm of oblivion. In fact, you could say that Ash Guardians are the antithesis of your typical Daedric Atronarch, for they were created by the god of mortals, Lorcan. Mainstream sources still tend to classify Ash Guardians as Daedric, but considering their origins, I would say this is a major misconception. Ash Guardians are made from the ash spewed forth from Red Mountain, and they are powered by the magic unique to Mundus, therefore, Golem would be a more appropriate term for them. The other kind of golem we know about is the Flesh Atronarch. A resident of the Shivering Isles, a Dunma named Relmina Veranim, is credited with inventing the Flesh Atronarch. She claims to have found the Flesh Element, and discovered a way to create golems by stitching skin and body parts together, creating a disturbing patchwork of mismatched corpses. These sewn together conglomerations of skin and muscle are adorned with mystical symbols, and wear an iron collar. Unsurprisingly, this was considered extremely taboo, and her work got her expelled from the Mage's Guild. 
it wasn't long before a new job opportunity presented itself, as the mad god Sheagorath invited her to the asylums to serve as the architect of his new gatekeeper. Unlike most elements, flesh is incredibly malleable, allowing for precise creations built for certain functions. Were you to make a fire or ice golem, you couldn't really get hands on with it. But with magically imbued flesh, crafters could even sew weapons into their arms, or make them as tall as towers. What's interesting about these Atronarchs is that sources claim the flesh shell acts as a vessel for Daedric souls, yet we've established in recent videos on the Daedra that they do not have souls, they actually have an animus called a vestige, and this is what allows them to be reborn. If a Daedra is killed, their animus returns to the void, before finding its way back to a source of chaotic creation where it can coalesce once again into its physical form. This is only a small detail, but I assume the word soul is just used to mean the animus. And putting the animus into the flesh golem works like soul trapping, which can be done to Daedra despite lacking a soul. But now that we've been through the distinction between Atronarchs and Golems, hopefully clearing up any confusion about the two, I'll end by talking about one horrifying story from the Deadlands, one which sets a dangerous precedent for future bringers of destruction. Mehrunes Dagon attempted to enhance the power of one of his strongest Dramora warriors by mutating its vestige, permeating it with aspects of a flame Atronarch. Valkin Scoria was the Dramora Valkanaz in question, and when Dagon finished his diabolical experiments, Scoria had become a gigantic blazing demon, the likes of which could destroy entire cities. The drawback, as Lyranth the Fool Killer, a Dramora servant of Molag Bal states, is that in order to maintain his molten condition, Scoria must ever abide in close proximity to magma. It also means that he eternally suffers the agony of immolation, as if he were being roasted by the flames of a dragon. And there you have it guys, the Atronarchs and Golems of the Elder Scrolls. I hope you enjoyed the video, thanks so much for watching, I've been Drew, and I'll see you in the next one.